I know they're welcome. We want to continue the work. So, so uh, back to that first question. Uh, Governor. Good, good morning, Governor. Um, Grace Ashford with the New York Times. Um, congratulations on six months in office. Thank you. Um, there's been a lot of talk about bail reform lately, um, with Mayor Adams calling for changes. Um, yesterday, DCGS Commissioner uh, testified that the available data was didn't provide a complete picture. Um, it, even so, the available data has been sort of debated between Democrats and Republicans, and everyone sort of seems to think what they have indicates them. I'm curious what, whether you see a need for a conversation right now about changes to the bail laws, and if not, why? I'm very data-driven, and I'm very interested in the data that comes out, but as the mayor mentioned, we are talking about damming up individual rivers. Today, the river we're talking about is the river that leads illegal guns from other states to our cities and in the hands of individuals who are using them. So that is our focus of what we're doing here today. As I've said from the beginning, there's opportunities to have these conversations with the mayor as well as with the legislature uh, as session unfolds on, uh, on any reforms that are recommended. Governor, there are calls for you to, to, to talk about bill reform right now. Uh, Republican Congresswoman Elise Stefanik just issued a, a letter on bail reform, and Republicans in Congress have proposed a bill that would reward states that gives judges more discretion in determining dangerousness. Uh, will you address what so many people have called on you to do? Will you address the level of dangerousness and give judges more discretion? Even Eric Adams has called on lawmakers to do this. He has asked for us to have this conversation, and he's a former senator, and he certainly knows the process that's involved in making changes. Changes were made. And I will absolutely stand behind the fundamental promise on why we needed bail reform in the first place. And I will describe the situation that others who are trying to politicize this and the other party don't seem to acknowledge why there was a need for change. You had two individuals accused of identical crimes, offenses, even stealing a backpack. And one person goes to Rikers for three years because they couldn't post bail. Another person whose parents have money or they're living in the suburbs and uh, can, they can head back after posting bail to their jobs, to school, and a different life. That is what bail reform set out to do. And so I stand behind that fundamental premise. And I've also said if reforms are needed based on data that is still being gathered, I'm willing to have those conversations. So I don't feel just because people, for political reasons, like the individuals that you're quoting here today, want me to give an answer, that's not how I operate. I don't cave to pressure. I do what's right based on all the facts that come before me. Next it's not over. just, but it's not just Elise Stefanik and Republicans. Even Chief Administrative Judge Lawrence Marks told lawmakers this week that he believes that judges are coming together and agreeing that they need more power. And I'm looking for the data that shows me that bail reform is the reason that somehow crime is going up in 90 of 100 cities in New York, why guns are flowing from Georgia with more frequency in Virginia and Ohio to here than they were. I'm focused on dealing with what I have control over right now, and that is my laser focus. The issue before me is today, in real time, bring the resources together to stop guns from coming into our streets and resulting in the shooting of a baby and the murder of our police officers. Nick. Governor, are we seeing, are we seeing yeah. similar issues in New York City that we're seeing also in like Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Albany, and not just you know general gun violence, but kind of similar systemic root causes for what's going on? Nick, is, this is exactly why I'm excited about the new Office of Gun Violence Prevention in the Department of Health. People have been shaken to their core from this pandemic. And I asked the question on a briefing call this morning, the numbers that we're seeing now did not exist in 2019. This was not the top of mind issue in New Yorkers or New York City, in Buffalo, Rochester at the time, because there was under control. And the statistics still bear out the fact that there were decades that were far worse. Now, I'm not satisfied with this. You know, one act of gun violence, particularly that results in the death of another person, is one too many. But I want to put this in context that this is not just a New York City or a New York State phenomenon, but I'm seeing the same impacts. People lost their jobs. They lost their safety net. They lost their support systems where they couldn't go get substance abuse treatment or mental health treatment. People fell through the cracks in unprecedented ways during this pandemic, and we need to be sensitive to that and realize that that is not an excuse to harm another human being. 
but it's also what is going on in their lives and in their communities that we need to help them heal and let them get on a path. And maybe it's helping them get that job we're talking about, getting them with someone who's a former gang member who will become a mentor for individuals. We've, I announced this in Buffalo, Rochester, and Syracuse just last summer. We're going to we actually triple the amount of money going into those programs. So, Nick, you're absolutely right that there are other forces at play that we're trying to analyze right now in real time because it's still going on of why this, there's such been such a dramatic increase in gun violence, an 80% increase uh, over a fairly short time. But that also says to me, given the short time frame where this has really become a, a heightened crisis, we also have the resources and the tools and the wherewithal to drive it down quickly. Uh, I'm hoping that we'll see something similar to what I track every single day and every single night, the Omicron surge. It went up quickly and then now it's dropping quickly. I believe that we have the capability to address gun violence the same way, and a large part of it comes from stopping them before they cross the borders into New York and get into the hands of individuals who will do harm to others. Okay, so Governor, to be clear, to what extent are you blaming out of illegal guns from out of state for the current surge in shootings, and what is the timeline for getting actionable findings from this new task force? Uh, soon. I told them I'm going to be uh, judging their results very quickly. I, I asked them to identify what success looks like. How will they know that this has been a successful uh, endeavor so we can replicate this elsewhere? But I, there's been uh, an in increase, 80 percent increase in firearm homicides and 75 percent. Let, let me make sure you have these statistics. 80 percent increase in firearm homicides here in the state of New York since 2019. 75 percent of the guns committed in those crimes came from out of state. So there is a direct correlation between what is occurring when people walk around, as the mayor talked about, the availability of guns is not the sole source of this problem, but it is one as governor of the state that, the state that has porous borders and the flow of guns is apparent to us. It has been going on, but now it has been exacerbated. I want to know why. Why now more than before are we seeing this increase? What is going on in those other states? What is going on with drug deals? What is going on with gang activity? Why are more guns than ever before flowing into the streets of New York, making violence so easily accessible for people to commit violence because they have guns in their pockets when they walk into an emergency room? So, so that is what we're – and so I'll be working – I'm going there right now to welcome them and tell them I'm looking forward to their analysis, and I will be coming back over and over and over and showing all of you the results. And if something isn't working the way I expect, we pivot, we try another approach. But I'm not going to sit back. While this is going on in the state of New York, people are fearful. They should live free of this anxiety in their communities, just like they did before 2019, 2020, when we saw this dramatic change. So, so I am going to welcome them. They've traveled a great distance. But thank you, everybody, for coming out today.